Hello, I'm Dr. Tony Evans with The Urban Alternative, and I can't tell you how excited I am about being one of the general editors for the Explore the Bible Project. I'm particularly excited about the three books I'm responsible for, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. I'm excited about those because they all have a social connection to impacting the community from a spiritual foundation. Ezra's trying to get folks straight <laughs> to get that temple worship back online. And uh, Nehemiah is trying to get the city rebuilt and, and solidified and order brought back to society. And Esther is demonstrating what you do when you're living in a secular realm and you uh, yield to the providence of God. So that's all exciting stuff for me and I hope it's exciting for you as you go through it. Esther represents one of the more controversial books of the Old Testament, one of those uh, debated books. How can you have an approved book in the Bible that never mentions God's name in any form or in any fashion? The only book in the Bible that does not do that. The book of Esther represents a series of events that occur over approximately a 10 year period of time between chapters six and seven of the book of Ezra. So you take the book of Esther and you drop it in between chapter six and seven of the book of Ezra. These are folks who did not go back with those returning from Persia. They stayed in Persia. In staying there, they found themselves being jeopardized by an evil Persian man named Haman. It's a book surrounding a personality, a beautiful lady named Esther. Esther, whose name means star, was the cousin of Mordecai who raised her. Esther had a unique kind of look and posture about her that grabbed the king's attention when he got rid of uh, his, uh, his first wife. And uh, Mordecai positioned Esther to be considered to be the new bride. Well, the king was so awestruck with her that he did just that and uh, married her. And now Esther, the foreign girl, is now in the royal court. She's situated in a place of influence, but the evil Haman wants to destroy all the Jews. And he gets a law passed to exterminate the Jews. Esther is in this position of influence and Mordecai writes to her and tells her, now is the time to identify yourself before your husband, the king, so that you can save God's people. It is one of the most fascinating stories in all of the Bible. Why was it written? This book was written to let the Jews know who are in Ezra's book, who have returned about the providence of God. It lets them see that even though in their return there were difficulty and challenges, God sometimes work over, works overtly, and you can see what he's doing. All the time he works hidden and providentially. You don't see what he's doing because it's all behind the scenes, but he's good on his word. He keeps his promises to his people, even when his people aren't exactly doing all that they were supposed to be doing the way God wants them to do it. You're going to be able to apply this to your life because you're going to be able to say, am I representing God in the strategic role that he has given me? Am I living for the kingdom? Am I maximizing my potential? Am I making a difference not only for myself, living large like Esther was, but am I making a difference for others? Am I bringing salvation and deliverance for people beyond me? All of that's part of this story. And uh, I don't wanna give you all the hints and all the tidbits, but you'll find some little things along the way that'll make this an exciting, exciting study. So welcome to the book of Esther. Welcome to a lady named Star. Welcome to God's providential care when he keeps his promises. Ezra is a priest and a scribe. Ezra's book comes at a time when Israel has been allowed to go back to Jerusalem for the rebuilding of the temple. It's representative of three trips that the Jews took to go back to the land as God told them to do when they would no longer be in the captivity of Babylon and the Medo-Persian Empire. Cyrus gave an edict, freeing the Jews to go back to their homeland. As they begin this trek back to their homeland, the first six chapters of Ezra is dealing with 
Zerubbabel taking the first group of uh, returnees from the Persian Empire back to the homeland. And then seven through 10 is dealing with Ezra taking the second group back. The concern of Ezra is twofold. The book of Ezra is concerned about the rebuilding of the temple and the reinstitution of the sacrificial system. Beginning in uh, 538, when Zerubbabel takes them back and gets the process started, to 458, when the next group comes to continue this process. When Ezra arrives, he finds out that the folks have regressed spiritually. They were excited to leave. It was an act of faith to leave, to believe that the land was there to be restored, the temple could be rebuilt. But like us, they wandered back spiritually. So when Ezra arrives, he's got to begin spiritual reforming the people so that they just don't have a physical temple and just don't have a sacrificial system, but they're the right kind of people who are worshiping the true God. So the book of Ezra is concerned with calling God's people back to God, back to proper worship, and back to proper living in light of proper worship. That book applies to us because God wants proper worship and proper living. He doesn't want us to have a church, a temple, when our lives are not being aligned with what the temple represents, and that is our relationship with God. Because he's both a priest, a representative of God, and he's a scribe, a recorder for God, he can proclaim the word and he can hold the people spiritually accountable and responsible for their lives. Ezra is living at the same time as Nehemiah. That's why when we get to Nehemiah, we'll see those names side by side, particularly in chapter eight. So they're contemporaries because Nehemiah is gonna lead this next group, the third group back. But Ezra is setting the stage spiritually for what will come with Nehemiah when he rebuilds the culture socially and politically. So as we look at the book of Ezra, look at it from the standpoint of getting the spiritual in place first so that the social can be placed properly later. And when you read the book of Ezra, look in terms of your own worship. Is it on point? Is your temple truly representing the sacrifice of Jesus Christ? And are the lives of the people who are in the temple consistent with what the temple is here to represent? I'm so excited about being the general editor for the book of Nehemiah. This is one of my special books in the Old Testament because it has to do with rebuilding society and I'm really into the rebuilding of society. Nehemiah comes at a time when the temple is being rebuilt through the movement of the two preceding returns from Persia by Zerubbabel and Ezra. But he finds out that the city is not being rebuilt. The gates are still down. The people are still vulnerable spiritually and physically and as families. He weeps and he wants God to use him for return number three in 444 BC. He is a cupbearer for the king. As a cupbearer for the king, his job is to be the executive assistant of the king. In addition to tasting the king's drink and food to make sure if somebody's trying to poison the king, he goes first. Uh, that person had to be a trusted person, a consistent person, he had to have administrative skills, he had to have loyalty, and he had to have good ability to oversee personnel on behalf of the king. So it was a major job, not just tasting food all day. So Nehemiah, this trusted man, but he's still burdened for his people back home in Jerusalem. When he hears the news that the city is still not functioning properly, he prays to God and asks God to open up a door of opportunity for him to make things better back home. And when the right time came, he asked permission from the king of Persia to go back to his homeland and to rebuild the society for political, social, and economic stability because all were being jeopardized. Religion was being put in place, although slowly, but now the society also had to be solidified. Having been given permission, protection, and provision 
by a secular government, Nehemiah makes his way back home with a plan and with returnees who join him to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. This is a book about rebuilding a community, rebuilding a nation. That's why I love it so much, because it lets us know that when you get the temple right, Ezra, and then you build structures for the well-being of society based on what comes out of that temple, then you can transform a community, even a community that's been in degradation for hundreds of years. So it is a book about social rebuilding. It talks about exploitation. It talks about justice. It talks about strengthening the family. And it does something else. Joining with Ezra, there's a call for a solemn assembly, a sacred gathering, a gathering to bring the people back to God, bring the people back to God's word as their primary authority, bring the people back to fellowship with each other, bring the people back to celebrating God's reinstitution of society as it was meant to be. That's how you should read this book. Yes, read it for your personal development, study it for your personal development, but think of it about your community being restored because of the spiritual foundation being laid that affects the social structure. That's why I'm hoping that America and that the Christians in America lead in a solemn assembly just like they did in Nehemiah chapter eight with the priest Ezra and the politician Nehemiah coming together to reconstitute and reorder a culture that was in decay. And just as they saw a culture restored, so can we. That's what the book of Nehemiah will help us to do.